this is the third program of the day, and the third program overall for the Comics Arts Conference, the scholarly conference within the convention here and at San Diego Comic Con. And we've been at this for many years now. And uh, I am uh, Dr. Travis Langley, one of the organizers. Kate McClancy, our chair, introduced the previous sessions. Uh, it is my privilege to be up here today uh, with our special guest. The Comics Arts Conference panels are a little different from what you see elsewhere, as some of you have already heard Kate mention today. Uh, we are taking a, a different kind of look, so you will not get the latest updates from Marvel. You will not get the celebrity <laughs> guest appearances. Very rarely. Uh, uh, I, I said guest appearances. This, he's, he is the appearance. He's not a surprise guest. Uh, so, uh, we are looking at the educational side of things, the academic side of things, or whatever our special guest feels like talking about. Um, we welcome. Now, my understanding is the, the name is Hawaiian in origin, therefore it's Lealoha? Correct. Right, so welcome, Steve. <laughs> And my job today is mainly to swipe pictures here. Uh, so, your own career, you've um, illustrated many things. When did you start in comics? Let's see, start. <clears throat> I started doing, working professionally in 1972. Um, but I generally tend to think of my starting comics when I started working for Marvel Comics in 1975. Um, I got a job working as an inker for Warlock, inking Jim Starlin. Mm. Um, and then pretty soon thereafter, I got work as an inker on Howard the Duck, inking Frank Brunner. Uh, anyway, that was in 1975. Um, the uh, the first little panel up there is uh, a section of page one of the first issue, How to the Duck. Um, I see I didn't put any Warlock in there, but uh, anyway, that's pretty much where I count my professional beginning. So where did you learn the kind of skills that led you into comics? Well, <clears throat> in those days there were no schools for uh, learning comics art, um, and in a way I just lucked out that uh, my ability to, to make a pen line go where I wanted it to go uh, coincided really well with working with somebody like Jim Starlin, who at the time was an extremely tight pencil. I mean, he knew what he wanted, so I just had to be very careful tracing the lines. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but uh, a lot of it really was on the job training. Um, as an eager, I always tried to watch what other artists were doing, and I learned a lot by being able to observe, observe some of the best artists in the business, like Neil Adams and Alfredo Alcala, and uh, artists of that sort. And, a little bit of what they were doing rubbed off on me. So. On the on the job training, was it just by observation? Were were they generous in lessons and tips that they had to offer? Generally, yes. Um, but by on the, on the job training, um, having to ink over the pencil work of different artists, mm. uh, you have to learn to be adaptable and. Uh, but the job of doing a comic book is a lot of pages with a lot of things that aren't really that important, like learning to to do cars, and trees, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So all of that's a learning experience. So that when you get to the the main characters, like Warlock himself, you feel a little bit more confident in uh, working that through. So that's that's kind of what I mean by on the job training. No actual training was involved. <laughs> I think when, when you're inking, you're also getting some feel for what the original artist must have done. So you, I would think there's a, a physical aspect of learning through that. 
as an anchor, I, I always saw my job as trying to finish the artwork that the penciler had in mind, which is tricky because most of the time we never actually got to talk to the artist. Um, I was lucky in that the first two jobs I worked on, well, inking Warlock and inking Howard the Duck, we all lived in generally the same neighborhood, so we could talk it over in person. Uh, but later on, I got to work over artists like Gene Colin and Sal Vicema. Uh, I, I never did meet Sal, hmm. but I love his work. <clears throat> uh, so there's a lot of trying to second guess what you think they have in mind and hope you get it right. Sometimes it takes a while to get into the flow of things uh, with different artists, but uh, it, it's, it's tricky to explain. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're talking about something that's a physical skill. It's not through words in the first place. Yes, yes, exactly. Now, when I think about your, the people you've worked with, the work of yours that I'm most familiar with, I tend to think of things that, that are a little darker looking. Uh, it's like, oh, even Howard the Duck had a dark look to it. Well, the, of course, the, the original idea behind Howard the Duck was that he was a character who came from, well, let's face it, the Disney Duck world. Came from Duckburg and wound up in Swamp Thing or Man Thing, Man -thing. the Marvel version. Um, so basically, it was a cartoony character with realistic rendering. So uh, it was just by the, the concept made it a darker character. Of course, it was also written by Steve Gerber, who had his own wacky sense of humor. Um, not sure where <laughs> we're going with this, but. Wherever you want to go. <laughs> uh, these particular images that you've chosen up here for the start of it, and you've been talking about Howard repeatedly. Like, why is it you want those to be what those would come to your mind as what stand out in your career? I tried to get a wider as wide a variety in one uh, in one grouping as I could. The first one is it's from the first issue of Howard the Duck. As I said, it's, which is where I came in. And then over the years, I eventually started doing a lot of work for Vertigo Comics and have been one of the regular anchors on Fables since the beginning in, in what, 2002, and in fact, still working on it today. Um, and that's an image from uh, a prose novel, Fable, prose Fables novel, with illustrations by me, and that was, that was one of the ones I liked. Um, I also picked it because most people probably have not seen it. And then for a while I did, was penciler on Spider Woman and did that for a couple of years. She was a particularly fun character that I worked on with Chris, Chris Claremont writing it. Um, and that was from one of the covers that I particularly liked that I recolored. Uh, and then the last one is a series of uh, sort of extemporaneous type drawings that I took to doing on the side. Um, working on comics is very focused and you have to, uh, of course, make the characters look the same in, in every panel. <clears throat> and so I started doing uh, sketchbook drawings, forcing myself to do one drawing every day, whether I felt like it or not. Um, whatever. Uh, so the, at the end of some of the examples of the four uh, off the wall kind of <laughs> drawings that I uh, have been doing, published it in, in some sketchbooks that I actually have a few at my table, should anyone be interested. So basically just a random sampling. And this is, uh, this is where I first started working for Marvel, and that's actually the first page I aimed on Warlock. <clears throat> um, I specifically started with that page because it was just a lot of uh, spacey, crinkly effects and stuff. And if you can't get that right, then you just need to give up. Um, anyway, so I started with uh, that and Thanos showed up, which apparently has become a big deal in the Marvel. <laughs> um, so uh, 
and uh, Captain Marvel also showed up in the series. All of these were drawn by Jim Starlin with my ink. And then it was off to Howard the Duck. Um, I worked as an anchor for the first two years of Howard, um, starting with Frank Brunner, and then John Buscema drew it, and then Gene Cola drew it. Um, which is, and in fact, the, the cover number eight, the middle drawing, is actually by John Romita. So hmm. it, uh, it was quite a challenge to. Uh, tie it all together, um, but a lot of fun. I mean, how could you not have fun making ducks? <laughs> <laughs> There's some more. Um, Howard was the first place where Kiss showed up inexplicably, but that's the kind of stuff that Steve Gerber tended to do. That seems um, an asylum, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, and, then it, and then they went into their own book. Anyway, that was a lot of fun because Gene Colin was not a follower of that kind of music. So, so um, he, he did a beautiful pen play job, and then my goal was to actually make it look like actual Kiss guys. Um, and then a, a drawing I did uh, uh, from the Marvel Comics swimsuit issue of Howard and Beverly, and a commission drawing that I did that I actually like. So. Stuff that in this image. The one in the middle. And then I lucked out by uh, getting the job working on the Marvel Comics adaptation of Star Wars. Um, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, living in San Francisco, I was well aware of George Lucas and who he was and what he was doing. Um, so, uh, anyway, it was, it was interesting because, you know, from an uh, employment point of view, uh, they had just begun giving royalties for, uh, for work at Marvel. If you work on a popular book and it sold a lot, you got royalties on it. But Star Wars was special, so there was no royalties on oh. it. Hmm. And Star Wars kind of saved Marvel in a way at that point. Well, maybe it's because they didn't give royalty. <laughs> but I figured it was a good trade-off because uh, uh, it uh, allowed me to uh, sort of see the inner workings of Lucasfilms and, and all of that. I, uh, I got invited to uh, a rough cut screening of Star Wars. So I was the first person working on a comic book that could actually see any of the actual movie. And the rough cut was, uh, it was Star Wars without any of the special effects. Um, <laughs> the, the, the TIE fighter sequence, all of that stuff was actually World War II footage. <laughs> um, the soundtrack was a temporary soundtrack. It was not John Williams. And in fact, at the, at the uh, the screening I was at, George, uh, John Williams was there, and it was the first time he saw the movie, which was a pretty ex trippy experience for me. The place was filled with movie guys, people who were actually working on the movie, and 20th Century Fox executives like Alan Land Jr. <coughs> and John Williams, uh, and comic book guy, me. Uh, anyway, it was. And then to see the finished movie only three months later was, was like a crash course in A-level filmmaking. <laughs> uh, and I just put in a gratuitous picture of Mark Hamill wearing a Howard the Duck shirt with that I inked. Sure. And I also got invited to the cast and crew screening uh, the week before the movie came out. To, uh, all of the American cast was there. Randy Harrison Ford, I showed him uh, the comics we were working on, and clearly it was the first time he'd seen himself drawn a com in a comic book, so he, he gave me his thumbs up. So. 
He's known for being a little bit of a human. He's, he's, uh, he, he can be a taciturn fellow, but he was very nice. Oh, very cool. Um, anyways, that kind of trade-off I was willing to do for not getting uh, royalties. <laughs> Although, in recent years, now that Disney owns both Marvel and Star Wars, mm -hmm. I've been getting various $20 checks. Not for, for, for well, it's like they own both Howard the Duck and Donald Duck, but Donald Duck was why they had a lawsuit that required Howard to start wearing pants. Exactly. It's, it's all very incestuous. <laughs> the, um, I know that the, the artist on the issue you've got up here, he felt that, that Star Wars hurt his career because it pinned down what people saw on, on his art. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yes, yes. Well, that's true. Well, I'm not sure you're telling tales out of how the expression is. Howard didn't think that the movie was going to be that good. He read read the script, thought, "Well, this is going to suck." So, <laughs> so he didn't really. I wouldn't say he gave it his a game. Um, Oh, look, he did draw a Darth Vader for me. You drew a Vader for me once. He's, he's willing to acknowledge that he, he drew Star Wars. I think. <laughs> uh, no. This is not you. All right, we've got... Oh, I like that one, so... I do. Uh, quack! Quack, and then I, then I worked on some other stuff, funny animal stuff. Uh, the first one is me inking and doing the color work over drawing by Dave Sim. That was fun working with him in the pre cerebral days. Um, and then a thing I did myself that was funny animals influenced by the French stuff that was coming to America at the time, uh, particularly Jean Giraud, Mobius, who was a major influence on me. Um, anyway, so that's how so? How, how, how do you think of Mobius? Again, it's, we're getting things that might be hard to articulate, but sure. how do you feel influenced by some of those movies? Well, growing up, I was, you know, 100% influenced by people like Joel Cain and Carmine Infantino. Okay. Um, and uh, totally American comics influence. And then seeing amazing stuff by French artists uh, who were doing graphic novels, which were definitely not the kinds of things that were being published in the U.S. It was a real item opener. The idea that you could do some, something really good that wasn't just part of the, the monthly periodical kind of things. I mean, when I first got into comics, it was sort of a, uh, well, I mean, outside of fandom, it was a throwaway. I mean, it would come out, people read them, and say, oh, that's nice, and then they toss it. I mean, I say it, but uh, to the general public, um, that was the kind of thing. And the French were doing stuff that was intended to be in bookstores and be on sale, uh, you know, for however long it would sell. So they were doing much higher quality work, which then in itself was inspiring. Uh, and Jean Giraud was one of my particular favorites. I mean, there's lots of French cartoonists who do brilliant work that I liked, but it was his work that I particularly focused on. Mainly because I like uh, the American Southwest and, and stories set in that uh, sort of uh, locale. And that's exactly the stuff that was going on in the Lieutenant Blueberry comics that he was had been doing, because he had actually visited there and was doing um, actually authentic uh, locales and things of that sort. So anyway, it was a major influence on me, aside from the, the Mobius Spacey stuff, but his, his realistic Western stuff was a huge inspiration to me. You mentioned Carmine. Uh, did you ink him at some point? I, got, I thought you had. What a, one of my goals as a young artist in the business was to at least once ink all of my favorite artists 
<laughs> if I could, and I specifically asked the editors of Marvel, you know, if the opportunity to arrive arose that if I could get a chance to ink some of these guys, which is interesting because a lot of the younger inkers weren't interested in inking the so-called old guys. And of course, the old guys were way younger than, than I am now, but uh, um, I mean, anyone, say anyone over 30, they just weren't interested. And so I got, I got to eat all of my childhood favorites, like Steve Ditko, Gil Kane, Jack Kirby, Carmine Infantino, uh, and some of the ones that, that I got to know later, I got to work with Marie Seven, John B. Seven, Sal B. Seven. Um, I know there's a lot more. And so on. You ever had to keep any of that original art? Yes. That's, that was another plus. That's a that's <laughs> of this stuff. Um, the fact that I, the Inca would get like uh, a third of the artwork. Two thirds of it would go to the penciler, one third of it the Inca got to keep. Um, which is another incentive for doing the best work that you possibly can because I got to keep some of that. So uh, if I wanted to get some John B. Sema artwork, I had to do a really good job over it and, and, and uh, hope that the pages that of my allotment were, were <laughs> interesting enough to keep, which wasn't the case. I, I do have some, some nice artwork souvenirs from working with these various artists. Uh, although Jack Kirby was a special case where at a certain point he demanded all of his artwork back, as you can understand. I mean, people who know the Kirby situation. Um, but, you know, as one of the young guys, we're all more than happy to work with Jack Kirby, even if it meant not getting any of the original artwork ourselves. So, I was perfectly fine with that. You still got that experience. You still had a Kirby under your belt, one way or another. I, I mean, I got to ink Kirby three times hmm. in real time, as I like to think of it. Um, you know, at the time, not inking over some Xerox that's 30 years old or something, which I've also done. But uh, um, anyway, so I, yeah, I did get to work with Kirby a couple times. And the legendary Steve Ditko several times. Even I got to meet him once, which uh, hmm. few people seem to have done. 